over the last couple of years, the NBA community and its fan base has slowly grown to a very respectable number. And with new people starting to enjoy the sport, along with more people starting to conversate about how great certain players are, there are certain things that are viewed more valuable than what it used to be. Because of this, this forces us to reevaluate how great certain players are in the NBA and throughout its history. And through conversation and dialogue, this also brings up certain details and nuances of a player's career that many people may not have been familiar with. But unfortunately, there are some players who get lost in this conversation. So in today's video, I decided to shed light on one of those players. A player that many of us are familiar with, however, I don't believe a lot of people thoroughly understand the details and the nuances of this player's career. A player who quite frankly should not have achieved the amount of success that he saw throughout his entire career. A player that I honestly believe I will change your opinion on how great he is through this video alone, and that player is Dirk Nowinski. Dirk, a player that many people are probably familiar with through some aspect, especially after the 2011 NBA Finals run, is a player that many of us know will be a future Hall of Famer, and a player that I'm not going to go into too much details about all his other statistical achievements because, again, I'm pretty sure a lot of you all are aware of this. However, the one aspect of his career that I believe many people consistently overlook is the amount of success that he saw throughout his career, especially in the postseason. And if you knew the nuances and details of his career, then I think many of you all would start to respect Dirk and his career way more than you do now. Because the level of difficulty that Dirk had to face consistently throughout his entire career is unbelievable. But before I go into any explanation on what Dirk actually accomplished throughout his career, let me first explain to you why it was so difficult. So for one, Dirk was drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks, but immediately traded to the Dallas Mavericks, an organization that saw little to no success within the short amount of time that it existed in the NBA. Matter of fact, throughout the entire 90s, the franchise was completely irrelevant. And to make matters worse, the amount of young talent that they were able to capture throughout the 90s, unfortunately, they had to trade all of them away and start from scratch. Another reason why it was difficult for Dirk is the lack of help he had around him. Throughout his entire career, he played with one All-NBA performer, and that was Steve Nash, who only made it twice, one player who made an All-Defensive team, and that was Tyson Chandler, who only made it once, a handful of All-Stars, and Steve Nash, Michael Finley, Josh Howard, and Jason Kidd, but mind you, Jason Kidd was a replacement, and one Six-Man of the Year winner in Jason Terry. To put that in comparison with a lot of other great players, especially the amount of success that Dirk saw, it's really unheard of. And then finally, and most importantly, we have the conference in which Dirk played in. The Western Conference during the 2000s, I would argue, is the toughest conference in NBA history. The amount of all-time players, teams, and coaches is unbelievable. And if you were a team or a player who didn't have multiple All-Stars or multiple All-NBA performers on your roster, then the amount of success that you could see was going to vary from year to year. But here's something that makes it even more impressive. Before the 2015 season, the NBA had a rule set in place where the playoff seeding was not only determined by the record in which the team was able to achieve during the regular season, but also the division winner had preferential treatment, which basically means if you won your division, regardless of what your record was, you were immediately going to be given home court advantage. This played a factor multiple times in Dirk's career due to the Dallas Mavericks playing in the same division with the San Antonio Spurs. We can all imagine that if any other top 50 greatest player of all time was placed in a situation that maybe only a handful of them would achieve what I'm about to explain to you that Dirk achieved throughout his entire career, which is why I believe that Dirk should be elevated way higher than I think a lot of people give him credit for. And what exactly did Dirk achieve throughout this stretch of years? Well, for one, the Dallas Mavericks between the 2000-2001 season all the way to the 2010-2011 season never had a season where they won fewer than 50 games. Consistently, a 50-win team every single year for an 11-year stretch. Which meant that the Dallas Mavericks throughout that 11-year stretch was the second most successful team in the NBA, only second to their divisional rivals, the San Antonio Spurs. But wait, I'm not done yet, because it's not just the regular season success that Dirk saw throughout his career that is so impressive, but it's also the postseason success as well. As you clearly can see, it's not as if like the Dallas Mavericks were one of the worst teams in the Western Conference. They were consistently winning 50 games, so you would assume that Dirk's path to the finals or even the conference finals would see some relatively easy competition. But that's not a case at all. Throughout this 11 year stretch, these are all of the teams that Dirk faced in the postseason. As you clearly can see, 
it's a bunch of 50 win teams. Matter of fact, to highlight these teams for you, there's only three teams who were able to win fewer than 50 games, two of which were literally a game or two away from being 50 win teams, which means that Dirk never faced a losing team throughout this 11 year stretch, which was impossible anyway, because during this stretch of years, the Western Conference was so talented that there was never a losing team who made the postseason anyway. But two and more importantly, majority of the teams that Dirk matched up with, again, were 50 win teams. But if that isn't impressive enough for you, here are all of the 55 win teams or better that Dirk had to match up with in the postseason during this same stretch of years. Nearly half of the teams that the Dallas Mavericks and Dirk had to match up with in the postseason during this stretch of years were 55 win teams or better. But here's something that's even more impressive. In the green, these are all of the teams that Dirk had to match up with, not in the conference finals, but in the second round. Nearly all of these teams won 55 games or more, and if you look at the Denver Nuggets, the only reason why they weren't a 55 win team that season is simply because Carmelo Anthony missed a handful of games. But when healthy, that was a team that was definitely on the tier of a 55 win roster. Now you may be asking yourself, well, how is this possible? And why is it that in the second round, Dirk consistently had to face a ridiculous amount of talented teams, especially when it comes to some of these 60 win teams. Well, that goes back to the divisional rules that I was talking about earlier. A great example of this is 2006. The Dallas Mavericks finished with a record of 16 and 22, which is the second best record in the Western Conference. Unfortunately, though, it was second best to the San Antonio Spurs, the team that played in the same division with the Dallas Mavericks, which meant that the San Antonio Spurs received the first seed with 63 wins. The Phoenix Suns, who won their division with only a 54 win record, won the second seed and the third seed went to a 44-win team in the Denver Nuggets, which meant that the Dallas Mavericks, despite the fact that they won 60 games and had the second best record in the conference, due to the divisional rules, they were awarded with the fourth seed. Now, the reason why this is so unfair is not only because they clearly have the second best record in the conference, but also you have to keep in mind, this means that they will only have home court advantage for one round, and also that means that in the second round that they will be matched up with the first seeded San Antonio Spurs team. So after beating a Memphis Grizzlies team that easily could have won 50 games in the first round, in the second round, Dirk Nowitzki and the Dallas Mavericks have to match up with a San Antonio Spurs team with Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and Manny Ginobili all in their prime. Also keep in mind that they also have really solid contributors in Bruce Bowen and Britton Berry. Also keep in mind that one of Dirk's ex-teammates and arguably one of his better teammates throughout his career, and Michael Finley, left the Dallas Mavericks and joined the San Antonio Spurs. And just to add the cherry on top of everything, you could argue that Jason Terry is the second best player on the Dallas Mavericks, obviously behind Dirk. But unfortunately, Jason Terry gets suspended for one of the games during the series. You could argue very easily that the Dallas Mavericks are not supposed to win this series. They're not even supposed to push it to seven games, but both happens. And thanks to Dirk and his late game heroics in game seven, they eventually win the series. Then they go on to the conference finals, match up with a Phoenix Suns team that again, you could argue that the Dallas Mavericks should not be able to beat, especially when you consider that Steve Nash was a two-time MVP, also ex-teammate of Dirk. And also you can look at the other players on the roster for the Phoenix Suns and you have a all NBA performer, most improved player, and a whole bunch of sharpshooters as well. Easy a team that's just as talented, if not more talented than the team that is surrounding Dirk with the Dallas Mavericks. But somehow, someway, Dirk still finds a way to beat the Phoenix Suns and make it all the way to the NBA Finals. Now, because I'm not biased, I will continue to tell the whole story because I believe this is a huge reason why many people just don't talk about Dirk and his postseason success. Dirk would go on to unfortunately underperform against the Miami Heat, and in the very next year in the postseason, he was knocked out in the first round by Golden State Warriors, who only won 42 games and had no business in beating them whatsoever after, yet again, Dirk underperformed. And then for the next handful of seasons, Dirk would consistently get knocked out in the first or second round, which has allowed many people to casually overlook what Dirk has accomplished so far in his career up until that point. But then eventually, as we all know, in the 2011 postseason, Dirk would yet again find himself in a situation where he should not have been able to achieve the success that he did. But wait, it doesn't stop there. 
Even if I were to remove the parameters around this 11 year stretch that I've been referring to and looked at all of the opponents that Dallas Mavericks have matched up with in the Western Conference playoffs during the Dirt Nowitzki era, as you clearly can see, the Dallas Mavericks and Dirt Nowitzki had the toughest playoff opponents possibly in NBA history. Still, matched up with only three teams who won fewer than 50 games, and mind you, two of them were only a game or two removed from being 51 teams, consistently matching up with teams who won 55 wins or better, sometimes 60 wins, and even some of those 61 teams matched up with them in the second round. I honestly don't believe people thoroughly understand how difficult this is, especially when you consider that Dirk rarely played with an All-NBA performer, only a handful of years with an All-Star, or even a player who made an All-Defensive team. And so for the amount of success that he earned throughout his entire career, consistently leading the Dallas Mavericks to 50 wins, matching up almost every single year, every single round with a 50 plus win team, while knocking off numerous All-Stars, Hall of Famers, and MVP winners on his path to making the finals two times and eventually winning a championship, Dirk's postseason runs are one of the greatest things that have ever happened in NBA history, and I'm happy I was able to inform you on this. And with that being said, people, please let me know what you feel about this video in the comment section below. Let me know if I changed your mind on Dirk and what he was able to accomplish throughout his entire career, because in my opinion, this does allow me to securely state that Dirk is the second greatest power forward of all time. And with that being said, I will see you all next time. Peace.